Afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for being with us here for this webinar, which brings together really two dimensions of our arts community here at The Ohio State University, our School of Music, and the Lawrence and Isabel Barnett Center for Integrated Arts and Enterprise. I'm kind of wearing two hats today because I'm housed primarily in the School of Music as Professor and Associate Director of Bands here at the University, and I also now serve as Director here of the Barnett Center. So it's in that uh, spirit that I come to you today. And uh, I wanted to share a little bit with you about those two units, the School of Music, uh, which is a unit large enough to take advantage of the endless possibilities of a university the size of Ohio State, and yet intimate enough to meet the individual needs of all of our students. Founded in the late 1800s, the School of Music offers today's students, faculty, and guest artists uh, innovative spaces for for making exceptional music for stimulating artistic growth and exploring educational methodology conducting groundbreaking research more information can be found by visiting the website music.osu.edu and the barnett center for integrated arts and enterprise opened in 2014 and it was created thanks to the generosity of lawrence and isabella barnett who had a deep belief in the arts uh, and in Ohio State. The Barnett Center educates and prepares students for successful careers in the arts and related entrepreneurial fields. More can be found there at barnettcenter.osu.edu. Regardless of whether you are here with us live or viewing this webinar after the fact in its archive format, we're delighted you're here. I'd like to go ahead and introduce you to our three guest panelists so that you have a sense for who they are. I'd like to begin first with Dr. Laura Portune, who is Associated Faculty Member of Voice in the School of Music. She teaches both graduate and undergraduate students. An acclaimed soprano, uh, Dr. Portune has performed over 60 operatic works and concert works internationally and regionally, including world premieres in the Czech Republic, Italy, and San Diego. Uh, she is equally home both in opera and in musical theater and also has directorial experience both locally and regionally. Dr. Portune, feel free to go ahead and unmute and, and say hello to our audience gathered with us here today. Hello, I'm thrilled to be here today. Thank you. You're welcome. Next is Malik Kalfani, who is a Toledo native uh, and pursuing a master's degree in orchestral conducting here at Ohio State. He's recognized and both uh, also growing in his recognition for his work specifically in musical theater. And while piano, uh, the piano keyboard is his uh, perhaps most comfortable home, he's also equally adept at many of the string instruments. I've seen him perform in the string section of our very own orchestra here at Ohio State. Um, and he has experience not only as a conductor, but also in orchestration and composing. Malik Kalfani, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and say hello to our audience as well. Hello, thank you so much for having me. We're delighted. Thank you for joining us. And lastly, Jake Jordan, uh, who perhaps while he wouldn't be comfortable with saying uh, this is really the primary reason that we are here. Jake is in his final year of an undergraduate degree in music education. His, uh, his primary instrument, uh, like Malik's, is piano, but he's also at home with many other instruments. Uh, Huron, Ohio is his home. And uh, he is in the process now of looking past the end of his time here at Ohio State to pursuing uh, graduate study in composition. Uh, his compositions range from piano solos and chamber ensembles to full orchestral works and wind band works. As a matter of fact, Symphonic Band is going to be reading one of his newest works here in just a couple of weeks. Um, he has a portfolio of over 25 pieces at this point in time. He's composed multiple short film scores and serves as an arranger for for various large and small ensembles. In addition to his work compositionally and as a student, he also volunteers as a tutor for students in RL skills uh, and also serves as an officer with our local music education professional organization. Um, and he is the person who orchestrated, composed, and pulled together this entire production, Sella the Musical. Uh, please everybody greet uh, Jake Jordan. Uh, unmute yourself and let us see your face, Jake. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming today. 
Fantastic. So that's our panel. And for those of you who perhaps hadn't uh, haven't had the opportunity to understand a little of what happened here on the evening of October 8th, uh, just this just this last month, let me give you a little bit of a glimpse. I want you to imagine an evening where several hundred people had gathered in Hughes Hall Auditorium. Uh, and then another several hundred people had gathered on online. As a matter of fact, I checked this morning and nearly 800 people have viewed the video that you're seeing a little bit of here as I share with you uh, about this to witness uh, a performance, a fully staged performance, including set and cast and a full pit orchestra, a 90 minute production completely student composed, student led, student centered, probably nearly a hundred individual students giving freely of their time and their talent and their energies to make this entire event happen. Now, I shared with you a bit earlier that my uh, hats that I'm wearing, not only as a faculty member in the School of Music, uh, are also rooted in the Barnett Center for Integrated Arts and Enterprise. And it's quite honestly, the focus of this endeavor as an enterprise, the entrepreneurial uh, endeavor that Cello the Musical is that really has my biggest attention and is really what we're going to explore here today. Um, arts entrepreneurship is um, a phrase that is defined in a variety of ways, but one of the definitions that perhaps is most apt for us today is this process of overcoming common challenges and historical barriers to the production, distribution, exhibition, and preservation of art. It's in essence creating something of value, um, not necessarily monetary value, especially in the arts world, but of value to people to come and want to be a part of. And Jake particularly created that not only within the School of Music, but and also drew in people to support him financially in this endeavor, as well as now more than a thousand people to take in this particular performance. So we're going to explore that in our time together and let's go ahead and start that conversation if we could uh, by Jake, having you just start with sharing with us a little bit about the backstory of, of Sela. So when did this idea come to you? When did the composing start? Give us some insights as to how, uh, what those early moments moments of Sella the Musical were for you? I would love to. So the uh, original musical is based off of a poem by William Cullen Bryant that was uh, given to me by my great aunt, introduced to me, I should say, um, sometime around when I was 14 or 15. And uh, she was very set on uh, having me compose some type of musical or some type of, uh, I think it was originally a ballet that she had recommended to me. Um, so I spent kind of a lot of high school conceptualizing, moving, moving in and out of what I would have wanted that to have become and didn't really have a concrete idea of anything. Um, fast forward to my freshman year, uh, at Ohio State, and I had decided that a musical would fit this uh, text in the best way. Um, and that was just a combination of my exposure to different types of groups, uh, like Off the Lake and uh, a few student ensembles in the School of Music. And I was, I was inspired after that, and I noticed that there was a plot that would be told there. Um, obviously the difficult part is, is that it was a poem. And uh, you can set a poem to music. Uh, you can't necessarily set it to theater that well because there's limited dialogue. So I, in tandem of with writing the actual music, I was also writing the libretto at the same time, which was, in my opinion, was a very great thing because it gave me a lot of flexibility. However, it was also a very limiting thing in that I am not a professional writer um, and I had to learn how to write for stage and write for uh, characters so that everything sounded natural. 
um, kind of step away from the formal writing that you get used to in high school. Um, so I had taken a decent amount of time to study what a musical was essentially. And um, for my approach, it was essentially going to the successful musicals that I knew and then slightly branching out from there. So Andrew Lloyd Webber, Sondheim, I was really intrigued by what they had done. And by that, I mean, they had taken the concept of a musical and they had really extended it to where, you know, back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, musicals were almost vaudevillian, very thinly scored, and um, you can move things around uh, and it, everything could be rearranged. And it was purely background entertainment, I would say. Um, and then you have uh, Bernstein coming out with West Side Story and a lot of these musicals in the 50s and 60s that extended on that. And then you have Big Broadway that came out of that. Uh, and then I was particularly interested by Sondheim who adopted the belief that new musical technique and new uh, types of overreaching musical uh, compositional uh, style should be brought out in musicals. We should expect our audience to kind of extend their belief of what a musical is. Now, Jake, um, let me just yeah. interrupt a, a little bit here and ask a question, because obviously a lot of people are getting to know you through this webinar. So were you one of those high school students who just was taken and over the moon with musical theater? So were you, the, were you that kind of student who was constantly listening to musical theater soundtracks and singing along in your car as you drive? Or is this uh, exploration of musical theater strictly just connected to trying to bring this project into being? Can you shed some insight on that? Yes. Uh, so no, in high school, I was not familiar with musical theater at all. Um, and that was just uh, out of my, I, I'll, I'll admit pure ignorance, I just wasn't looking in that direction at the time. And um, I, that, that's one of the great things that happened to me at the beginning of freshman years that I was introduced to some of these things. And I don't want to necessarily say forced to listen to, but I was introduced to the point where I was like, wow, I am missing a huge category of music that I definitely should be aware of. I um, so really insightful then of you to recognize this is a gap that I have in, as I think about myself as a composer and filling that in. Fascinating. Yes. So I, I took the time and familiarized myself. And I admittedly, I familiarized myself with the um, the musicals that everyone knows. <laughs> I, I didn't dive too deep at the beginning and that was uh, intentional and not intentional. I knew that I had to understand the basics and what grabs everyone before I kind of took a deeper dive into, okay, uh, everybody you know, loves this musical. Now, what, what makes a, a, a different musical kind of more unique? Um, so extending from that, I started writing in a more poppy sense, but I incorporated some of the learnings of uh, classical composition uh, that I could get away with in a musical. Um, and if you listen to Sala, it's borderline opera. It's right on that line sometimes. And it requires a great amount of effort from the director and the musicians. Uh, and I was, aware of that to a certain extent, I didn't necessarily become super uh, hyper aware of it until I had musicians in front of me. Um, anyways, getting, getting back on track, I had decided now that once the musical was completed and I felt comfortable with it, that I should probably go ahead and make an attempt at getting it either read or played or anything at that point. Uh, Ohio State has a program here called STEP, and it is essentially for second year students who are looking uh, for a transitional process. So uh, you can use this grant 
for studying abroad. You can use it for any type of creative endeavor. Uh, and the focal point of this program is making sure that you are gaining some type of learning process and a transition into a next educational step or next period of your life. Um, so throughout these seminars at the beginning of my sophomore year, I was, you know, thinking, going back and forth, oh, do I, do I want to study abroad? Uh, and I think it was two or three weeks in, I was talking to my step mentor and she had brought up, she's like, well, do you have any compositions that, that you think you, you would want to get played by a group? And I kind of went home and thought, and I was like, you know what? Uh, it's very ambitious, but maybe I could get some of this uh, played, recorded, anything like that. Um, that's when, unfortunately, COVID entered our lives. And uh, for most people, that was a real stunt. And for myself, I would say it was. However, it gave me an opportunity, actually exactly uh, nine months to review what I had written, clean it up, and kind of assess, you know, this, this is what I had written. I need to fix this and this. And by the time that campus was starting to open up, I contacted Steph and I said, a full scale production probably isn't possible at this point. However, a recording process is, I'm thinking. So I asked them, maybe we could get this grant for a recording process. And they promptly said, yes, of course. And that's when I was introduced to Dr. Portune by Dr. Hedgecock and we got started on trying to find a cast because I had realized, wow, I know absolutely nothing about casting anyone and I need someone who knows what they're doing. Sure. Jake, let me interrupt just for a quick second. I'm realizing that as versed as we are in what STEP uh, is and how that works, uh, that there may be some that are watching that perhaps aren't. So STEP, the second year transformational experience program here at Ohio State is really a cutting edge program that Ohio State started nearly a decade or so ago. It has become uh, the envy of a lot of institutions around the country like Ohio State. And it is a program through which groups of second year students uh, are put into uh, small cohorts of between 15 and 20 students at the most with a faculty mentor who meet weekly in the autumn semester. And the end result of this sense of community building being together at a cohort is an exploration of self uh, and then the possibility of applying for a fellowship uh, for which uh, $2,000 is earmarked for each of the students in step and they can explore a, pro a program. It could be an extension of their professional walk in uh, life. It could be just an interest that they have as a human being or a person to uh, use those funds toward uh, the creation of something or some kind of an experience. And Jake, do I have it right? So this idea that started off way back with a sharing of a story from a dear beloved relative of evolves into what could I do with this? How could this become something? You find yourself at Ohio State thinking more about this. And now the intersection of step has come into play. And this possibility of, of creating something with this idea that has long been percolating in your mind. Do I have that? Is that the kind of the Reader's Digest condensed version of, of that which you've shared so far? That is it exactly. Wow, an incredible kind of uh, constant curiosity I'm hearing already in you about music and things, and then also this incredible um, op op taking advantage of opportunities and resources that are around you. Now, I know you were right on the cusp of just, you just said Dr. Laura Portune, so I will now be quiet and let you make this segue, and perhaps we'll bring her into the conversation uh, uh, next. Yes, absolutely. So. Uh, one of the difficult things about this process is finding voices that are going to be able to accurately um, portray your characters that you've written. Uh, for me, the difficult part was trying to summarize to myself who my characters were. And uh, I'm going to put a bookmark in this because I spent a great amount of time trying to decide this is who my character is going to be. And that, that's an important 
lesson that I learned later on um, that maybe I didn't have to decide that as, as concretely as I thought I did. Um, so I'll, I'll let Dr. Portune kind of explain a little bit of her involvement in this, uh, but essentially she was a great point of education for me in how you interact with vocalists or how you interact with uh, just even actors and um, where each person's job essentially lies. So Laura Portune, here comes Jake Jordan, who says, hi, I have this idea, will you help? <laughs> and give us some insights of that moment for you and then the process that unfolded there. And, and one of the many questions I have is, what, what drew you to say, sure, I've got time for this, somebody who is already a very busy performer and educator and human being. Uh, tell us about that, that moment and, and all which followed, uh, if you would, please. Absolutely. So the first time that I met Jake, was through this project. And um, as he had mentioned, Dr. Hedgecoff had kind of put our names together. And um, so Jake approached me with this. And in the beginning, I was probably most struck by his maturity. I kept thinking, this is a, at the time a sophomore. Um, and so I just felt like, this, or junior, I felt like this is, this remarkable kid who's been able to accomplish so much in the midst of also being a student and all of the, as we know here in the music department, all of the endeavors that are, that come with being a student. Um, so I was really struck by his vision and his desire to put this on. Um, in addition to that, it was COVID and we had such limited opportunities that here comes a student with opportunities for my students and all of our vocalists. It was just such a beautiful thing to be able to say, here's an opportunity that we didn't know that we had. And some of these vocalists can now sing during this time of COVID. Um, so we, we put about you know, some names, we started putting together a cast and um, that really was kind of all he had asked of me, but I was so taken with this project at that point that then I jumped in with both feet and volunteered to start coaching the singers, um, worked with them a couple times a week as needed. And then I was able to also just advise as needed. Um, one of the things that Jake and I talked about was how, this was a professional production. We were putting on a recording. This wasn't a school run thing necessarily. This was professional. And along those lines, we talked about writing up a contract. And um, I really wanted to make sure that he was protected with his original work, that the students knew exactly what the expectations were. And it also set the benchmark for this being more than a school class. It was something that stretched them a little bit further and gave a little bit more credence to what they were doing. I have to ask, in the course of your time teaching, has a student ever come to you with an idea this uh, large in its scope? Uh, how common an experience is <laughs> you have somebody going knock, knock, hi, we've never <laughs> met, but. <laughs> this is the first, and I will say, it, it was kind of a twofold thing because of COVID. We primarily worked on the recording together, but it was always with the intent of it being staged. And so um, because it had to be two separate things, it became, I think, even bigger than perhaps it would have been. Um, but it also gave it the focus that it needed. It wasn't just a recording of a live production. It was an actual recording in a studio. And that for the vocalists was such a wonderful opportunity because it gave them an opportunity to go in and learn how to pace, learn how to take care of their voices because they knew they would be recording. Um, how much voice could they give if they were going to be there for an hour? And then you also have to remember all of this was happening with masks. And as you can see in the video, 
They recorded the entire thing in masks. They did the entire production in masks. So it was all of these challenges that the students just jumped right in and they were just so thrilled that they had this opportunity. And again, I cannot stress, the opportunity came from a peer, from a student. Although I will say, even though um, Jake and I also had a lot of conversations where he was in kind of a difficult position in that he was a peer and a student, but really was the leader of this whole project. And he handled that so gracefully because he was able to oversee and be in charge, but still maintain a rapport that was very collegiate. And I think that's hard for adults to do um, who are in a position over students, but to be able to do that when you are still a student alongside your colleagues, your peers, it really, that was, that was a maturity that was very impressive to me. You know, and as we're watching this video, and I'm sure that those of you who are, who are seeing this are looking at this and seeing this professional sheen, this polish, uh, that uh, seeing our students in a recording studio, and as, as Dr. Portun just mentioned, masked, uh, Jake, I'm, I'm recognizing that some of this, this looks like digital union facilities. These are resources that are available to students here at the university. Is that right? Absolutely. So taking advantage of also the resources that are available to you, not only in terms of, in the case of Dr. Portune, uh, uh, an incredibly versed professional who has this experience that perhaps you have yet to, to gain yourself, but then also the resources of the university here that are available to any student, any one of our 60,000 students can make the opportunity to use those facilities. But pulling together all of these resources, there's a resourcefulness thread that is also playing out in this story as well, in your ability and desire to want to pull others into this uh, production. And I hope that you'll share uh, a little bit more about that as we go, because I know that in our conversation, it has always been clear to me that you wanted this to be as much of a win, 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 win kind of an endeavor in which everybody involved was somehow going to benefit in one way, shape or form uh, from their involvement with this. So let's go ahead and pivot if we could, Jake. So now, the, so you've done this recording. It's now available, if I remember right, I think I saw it first on perhaps iTunes or uh, perhaps on Spotify. Am I remembering right? You were able to push those out to, to, for distribution there. Is that right? Yes. And then at some point it became like, well, we're still in the midst of this uh, pandemic, but let's perhaps decide to actually stage this thing. <laughs> so we have yet to really be fully sure that we're gonna be back in person in the fall. Tell us now about this moment in which, talk about overcoming obstacles, good gracious. Uh, when did the idea of going, I think we could actually make this happen in person on stage with a set and lights and sound and an orchestra. Uh, tell us about that moment. Yeah, of course. Um, obviously, that was a big ambition of my of for for me to have because, especially right now, when kind of uh, gathering large groups of people could be uh, really dangerous. But um, there was, I think, it was three days after that recording came out. I was so happy with it, and I was so happy with what everyone had done my first thought was boy this would look so good on stage and <laughs> every every ounce of me was like I have to I have to so I, I do want to place a heavy emphasis on making sure that opportunities were provided for everyone and um I find this important because uh, it's a personal goal of mine, not only in my, you know, in my career, but just as, as a person to give opportunities to people. And as a music education major, I've learned over the years that seeing people have these opportunities and grow from them is not only rewarding to them, but it's also rewarding to you. So I kind of, I took a selfish thought and I was like, you know what, I, it, it feels good to see people be able to, you know, grow from something. Um, so 
I did maybe about two or three weeks of brainstorming and writing down how far can we take this essentially. Um, and originally I'd wanted to get a pit together of about five or six people um, and have one student conductor. Um, if you were there on opening night, that was not the case <laughs> at all. Um, we, uh, <laughs> we ended up with a pit orchestra of 40 people and a graduate conductor who has years of experience. Um, but stepping back, it, that doesn't happen magically at all. Uh, you, have to, uh, you have to think like an artist and be ambitious. And then you have to think, unfortunately, like a businessman. And you have to say, all right, this is what can happen based on the resources. And then this is what we might have to pull back a little bit on. All right, now let me just interrupt there because this is where my Barnett Center hat comes in. And the word, unfortunately, think like a business person is actually the great gift in this. Yes. I must tell you that that sense of entrepreneurial thinking, which is I want this to happen, but I also have to think about this as enterprise, as an endeavor. And one of the most remarkable features, I think, to many of us about this was your ability to consider those details. And I think sometimes, and Jake, maybe you would agree with this, and maybe Malik and, and Laura, you would agree or disagree with this as well, that sometimes our students, especially in, in higher education, want to think just about the art and not about the rest of what's this look like to bring people together, to bring something into being. How does that, uh, I don't want to get too far afield here, Jake, but you just touched on a really important thread in this conversation today. Uh, about that sense of art and the enterprise of making things happen. Thoughts from uh, uh, any of you about that, Dr. Bortun or, or Malik? Yeah, I would agree 100%. I think that particularly as musicians, we joke that we wear many hats all the time, but part of that it's because we, we really need to be well-rounded. There are so many different sides of what we do um, that are important, but it's also because we have to make those opportunities for ourselves so often. And it's not, it's not just enough to be prepared for the opportunity. Sometimes you're the instigator and often you're the instigator. And as Jake pointed out, it's not even just for yourself, it's opportunities for everyone involved. And it is so much business thinking. Um, I like that he was making the distinction between thinking like the artist and then thinking like the business where you have that plan and it's not just, oh, this will be great and I practiced. No, no, it's you're making these steps to get to the goal. And I suspect Malik, you've had experiences with this. We're gonna to get to know you a bit more here in just a moment, but your sense for that side of what it is that you've done in your engagements? Absolutely. I mean, there, there is so much to that. And I think that what we're touching on is that a lot of us artists don't usually think about that in the way that Jake has been able to. And something else quickly to note um, is that, you know, when you're working on a production uh, the size of Sella, uh, you know, whether it's been a production that's been around for a while or it's just as new as Sella, you often have many different people wearing those hats, regardless if they're balancing multiple hats at a time, you usually have a team of people behind a table making all of these decisions um, collectively. Um, and, and what's just so uh, magnificent about the cell itself is that there was really one person wearing all of those hats. And so for it to be such a success is out of this world. It really is. Um, so a, a huge testament to Drake, to Jake. All right. Well, again, I know any of us who know Jake knows he's now squirming in his seat in his study because he does is a very humble person in that regard. But yes, I, I couldn't uh, agree more, Malik, with that with that sentiment. Um, okay. So, Jake, thanks for letting me just kind of veer off off path there for a second, but actually on path with one of the great takeaways for this, especially I think for some of our students who may have looked at this and gone, "Oh, I'd love to do something like that." to get a sense for, well, yes, but you, it just doesn't happen. You have to think deeply about all of the dimensions of the project, which, which again, as Malik just said, you, you did so beautifully. Um, okay, so you've got this art, you've got now thinking a bit business-wise. I, I know that um, just in the interest of time, that uh, can you move us into and through kind of how did the, the planning, the timeline of this, um, uh, there's a whole sense of promotion. There's a sense of bringing donors involved in this. Can you kind of 
give us a sense for that dimension of this process of bringing this production into being on stage? Absolutely. One of the hardest things for me was to get into um, this mindset where uh, making things happen uh, entrepreneurially. But once, once things did happen and once I got into that mindset, I realized, wow, this is actually um, possible. I, I can think like this. And not only that, it also gets things done because, you know, everyone wants to see, you know, I wanted to see this great big stage and this theater pack with 8,000 people. Um, and you have to learn, well, first performance ever, probably not going to happen, but that's, I wouldn't call that a sacrifice because the fact that it's happening at all is a big deal. Um, but anyways, so um, we, I, I went on to have a meeting with uh, Professor Miriam Burns here, who's uh, the, the uh, uh, director of the orchestra. And we, she found Malik. Malik and I had met briefly earlier in the semester and he agreed to take on the role of uh, music director. It, it actually kind of started as just conducting, but then it, it went on to directing. Um, and then we, we had to think about um, how are we going to promote this? Because we can get these groups of musicians together and we can you know, make this happen, but if there's no people there, it won't make any sense. Um, but as, as that was happening, I sent out an email to all the studio professors and a few of my friends uh, asking for volunteers. And I set up a schedule so that we would rehearse based on their availability, essentially. Uh, one of the harder parts of this is giving them an incentive to spend four hours a week in a rehearsal because that's a very large amount of time. That's how much time they spend uh, in class, uh, in, in cl actual class ensembles usually. Um, so I talked to the administrators at the School of Music and I talked to some uh, of the studio professors and we all had made a, an agreement that if they wanted to, they could receive small ensemble credit for this opportunity. Um, which is a requirement for, I, I believe, every degree here. Um, and that way they were getting some type of credit for doing this huge, huge amount of work. Uh, so we ended up figuring out, uh, we would rehearse on Sundays from four to eight. And uh, this is our first rehearsal here on screen, as you can see. Um, and, Malik was able to uh, kind of get these groups together. He also got a few more strings because after that first rehearsal, we realized, wow, we, we need a bigger string section. And that's part of why that eight person ensemble became a 40 person ensemble. Uh, however, there were also just almost twice the amount of volunteers than I, that I had anticipated. And that alone was a big shock to me because to see that support from my peers was one thing and then for them to volunteer such a large amount of time to such a huge project was another thing um, and that only showed me the dedication and musicianship on behalf of you know everyone at the school of music um, and then i decided uh, sometime midsummer, you know, we have someone who really knows what they're doing up on the podium. Why wouldn't we have people learning from him? I mean, yes, we have the ensemble learning music, but why wouldn't we have a certain amount of people sitting beside the podium who maybe want to pursue a conducting career? And one of the hardest things as an undergraduate is getting time on the podium. That's nearly impossible. It's really difficult because you're standing in front of an ensemble and there are definite goals. And I, there's, I, I can think of one group on campus because they were just formulated as an ensemble to create conducting experience. But other than that, it's really difficult. 
So uh, I created an application with Malik and Professor Burns, and this process I actually stepped away from. I, I had them create a few questions with me, and then I wasn't going to decide who was going to get that position. So we had applicants, and then uh, Malik and Professor Burns decided mutually who they would take on. Um, and they attended every rehearsal, every rehearsal and had an opportunity to step up at the podium and rehearse the uh, pit ensemble for five to 10 minutes usually. And that alone was a, a pretty big deal, not only for them, but for me, because I was able to see, wow, this is, this is growth over the course of the six weeks. You know, the first time that they stepped up was admittedly a little rough. Everyone was rusty, including the pit. Uh, come to week six, and it was almost a professional scale ensemble like you would see in Broadway. I mean, it was just seriously impressive for six weeks. <laughs> so Jake, you've talked a lot about now where we are and we've, uh, we're seeing pictures obviously here of the rehearsal process. And, and again, to those people seeing this for the first time, there's this professional uh, look to all of what's happening here. Uh, microphones and technology and Malik, we're seeing you here at the soundboard. Let's pivot and bring Malik, if we could, into the conversation. So Malik, you and Jake have a, a number of things in common, not only your your deep passion for music making, but you also have an undergraduate degree in music education, right? Am I remembering that correct? That's correct, yes. And yet here you are in this endeavor, of course, with this incredible passion as a conductor, and of course, pursuing a master's degree in orchestral conducting. Share a little bit with us about your background, and then perhaps uh, if you could, uh, getting into this project, as with Dr. Portune, this why say yes, like what was it that made you go, oh sure, I've got plenty of time for this. Uh, you are also an active uh, professional uh, in your own right, uh, as well as a graduate student here. So share with us a bit about your story and this uh, coming together of Sela and you. Sure, I'd love to. So I, uh, as you mentioned, I do have a degree in music education. However, I knew initially when I uh, started to go to college that my, my path would be different. Um, uh, I knew that I wanted to be a music director, uh, not just a conductor, but a music director, which is a very American term, um, which there is no clear path for music direction in the United States until the last five years, actually. It's extremely fresh. Um, and so I didn't know how I would get from point A to point B of being a music director um, prior to five years. Um, I started conducting when I was 13 years old. My, I made my conducting debut with the Toledo Symphony. Um, and then from there on, I uh, conducted projects and then I, it was time to go to college. Well, what would that look like? Um, and then I decided that getting a degree in, uh, in conducting would be the closest way to get to, to, to bridge that gap. Um, but of course, to do that, to bridge the gap underneath of that, I had to get uh, a grad, an undergraduate degree. And so I thought, well, what would be the best use of my time for four years in undergrad if there's nothing that directly relates to conducting, which you can't do in the United States. You can't get a degree in conducting until the master's level. Um, so I decided that music education would be the best path simply because I was going to be forced to learn all of the instruments. Um, I was going to have to sit down with every instrument that I would be asked, uh, asking them to do something with, um, and I would have to learn it, play a scale with it, learn the fu fundamentals. Um, and so four years later, I feel very confident on the podium because I spent four years, not that I, I, I didn't pay attention to how to educate or what was the value of that, but I really knew right away, I'm doing this so I can spend time with these instruments and really learn what's possible, what I'm asking of these musicians. Um, and so that was a very, very valuable four years of mine. Um, and then I went to uh, Kent State right after that. I graduated in 2020 um, and I went to Kent State to major in uh, orchestral conducting. Uh, but during that time, uh, I reconnected my relationship with Professor Miriam Burns, who I have met about 10 years ago. Um, and she is fantastic. She is a, a previous assistant conductor with the New York Philharmonic. And um, so, of course, just hearing that alone of uh, just many accolades that she has carrying around with her, um, an opportunity came uh, for me to study with her here at The Ohio State University. And I, I quickly said yes. And I came down and I transferred now this year. 
and I, I have never looked back. But during all of this time, I, I actually started music directing in high school when I was a senior and eventually uh, music directed my first musical, The Sound of Music, when I was 19 years old with a uh, with a 24 person pit. Uh, it was it was a beautiful experience, but I instantly fell in love. And I, I think that there's this misconception uh, commonly in the United States that opera and musical theater are two different worlds that, oh, you know, musical theater is so much easier. Or it's for uh, it's amateur compared to opera. Um, and I and I don't know where that misconception came from, but uh, it's it's uh, unfortunate, I guess, to say the least, that that is true because it is very difficult to put up a large scale professional uh, musical theater production. Um, and so I, I started that, and I have never uh, regretted taking that journey. Um, but I am to the point now with where my my job really consists of going from a theater house or opera house to you know around the country. And, and putting up shows and staying there for for several weeks and, and meeting you know in, in vocal coaching and accompanying and, and conducting the production um, and then so when I got here I had actually just been in, in Michigan for seven weeks um, music directing Godspell and I uh, I had one day actually to get from Michigan to Columbus in order to start my projects here um, and then that is around the time when when uh, Professor Burns as you can imagine I'm, I'm extremely busy uh, Professor Burns and, and Jake reach out to me and say hey can you conduct this large large project and so the why say yes is actually a really important question to answer here um, because it's a, it, it was a large project to, to, to undertake um, but after looking at the score that was the first thing I asked well what can I see a score um, I have worked on probably four or five new work projects so far um, as a music director. Um, and there was immediately something different about this project as a new ensemble or, or a new work compared to all the other ones that I've written. Um, it was so seamless the way that it was written. The story made sense. Um, the way I could I could envision what it was going to be like on stage. So I guess what I'm getting after is I, I didn't feel like it was a, my other new projects where I was putting on where, okay, we're going to need to change this. We're going to need to change this. And we had to rework the entire thing before we even got to the point of putting up the production, um, the, the the product was there. We just had to put it on the stage, um, and so that was. It, it, he was writing at such a high caliber um, that I knew that this was going to be worth putting on. It wasn't going to be me sitting up at two a.m. rewriting orchestra parts. We were really going to get to start hitting the ground running and putting on a full production. Um, and so that was why I said yes, because otherwise I truly would have said no uh, for this large scale of a project if, if I would have had to go through the nitty gritty and, and, and rework an entire score. But that wasn't the case here. Um, there are a number of through lines. I mean, it's just amazing. This conversation, first off, this could last for hours because there course. are so many connections. The opera musical theater connection between all three of you as panelists has come up in different ways in the conversation. And Malik, one of the uh, many things that I'd like to call out about what you just shared is this sense of knowing your craft and knowing your art. It's not enough to just say, hey, I want to do this, but I really don't know what I'm doing. Uh, the busyness and the uh, insane kind of, uh, it's an attractive sense of like, I'm, I'm here for six weeks and I'm here for seven weeks and that stuff. That is not, however, just activity for the sake of activity. It's all grounded deeply in knowledge. You talked about knowing your instruments, about having this relationship with those to be able to then work with these people who are playing those instruments as time comes on. Uh, and then you've mentioned as well this sense of craft and opening that score and seeing what it was that Jake had created and recognizing, ooh, there's quality here. This isn't just let's try this and oh, isn't that fun and exciting. Uh, David Bringer, who leads our music media and enterprise in a recent conversation, talking about just entrepreneurial thinking, said that yes, you have to have some kind of an economic model and structure for some kind of entrepreneurial endeavor. And yes, it needs to serve some kind of a social purpose, but it also has to be good art. If we're talking arts entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, the art itself has to be really good. And I wanted to just highlight that moment because that sense of quality, not only in your work, but in what it was you're working with, and Dr. Bortune mentioned this as well, that sense of high quality professional, let's do this well, because the art is enables that. Uh, is not something to to be overlooked. Is is that would that be accurate? That's absolutely accurate. Yes, I would completely agree. Um, and Jake did a really, you know, we live in an era now where it, it's it's digital, unfortunately, and, and and slightly fortunately, it depends on how you look at it. But 
in, in the art now, um, it is so much more um, about just being, uh, just being um, talented or, or being good. I mean, of course, I, I guess what I'm getting after is, is it's, that's the baseline. I mean, if, if you're not at least talented, if you're not good at your art, you don't stand a chance, but that, of course, um, if you are, okay, well, now there's the, the, the perspective where you have to put that out work out there, right? Because uh, it, it there's so much artwork at the palm of our hands and our phones and our cell phones that it, it just is introduced to us and people are no longer going out looking for it anymore. Um, and so Jake did a really great thing where he was really pushing for people to get involved and to come to this musical. Um, and, and it wasn't for a selfish reason. He wanted them to be a part of it and create and create art that was also really good, that was contributing to a, a much larger scale. Um, and something that I really go back to as uh, I mentioned earlier that musical theater is unfortunately looked at as, as, as amateur, um, is that Wagner, when he was writing his operas, um, wrote uh, in the sense that he thought of them as what he called music dramas. And why he loved opera, uh, opera and writing for the stage is because there was no greater art than staged uh, musical productions. Uh, and, and what he was getting at is that there, there requires so much art that is 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 at the at the end of the day one art form. You know, you have the you have the lighting, you have the music, you have the staging, you have the dancing, you have the singing, and there's so much art. It, it's just so beautiful to put it all together, and then call it one art, which is depending on what you're looking at, opera, musical theater, music dramas. Um, and so there, I, I'm very passionate about that because I think that it's so cool, the, the collaboration that you get to do with so many artists who are so good at so different things, all coming together to create one piece of work. Beautifully said and a great reminder uh, to us about the entirety of, of what this is. You encapsulated the whole endeavor so beautifully there. To those of you who gathered with us live, if you have some questions you'd like to ask our panelists, I invite you now to just type those into the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, it's a, a wonderful opportunity here. Again, the conversation could go on much longer, uh, but we do want to be respectful of time for everybody involved. Um, I'll start off with a question perhaps now. One of the reasons that we did this after the fact, there was a lot of, of course, press and excitement getting into an activity, but you all now have had a chance to step back from this. There's been some time, some space to reflect and to ponder a little bit about what this endeavor itself was. I'm curious if each of you have a quick um, uh, a memory that you hold is really fond or that you are really taken with as you look back on this experience, either your own part of it or in its entirety. And perhaps Dr. Pertun, let's let's start with you first. As you look back, what 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 stays with you? What gives you that sense of inward smile as you think about this endeavor? This is actually a very easy one. Um, so I was primarily involved in the um, in the recording aspect of this. And because it was a recording with tracks, I had never heard the orchestration. I had never heard all of this come together. And then um, Jake and Malik were very wonderful in the conception of having the students take over this project and it being a student run thing. So we have the student conductors, we have the directing, we have even all the way down to the mics and the lighting, everything was students, which was just incredible to watch. Um, so until the dress rehearsal, I really was not a part of the process that had been continued. And so I went and sat in the back of the house and kind of watched a rehearsal. And it was the first time that I could actually sit and watch Malik working. And he was so commanding and had such a respect on from the performers to the orchestra to and watching Jake walking around, fixing things and writing notes. But then the production started and I, I honestly can tell you I was blown away because to hear, for one, there was this full, this full um, orchestra, all of the sets, all of the performers singing with their microphones, but you know, masks and everything everybody's so invested and to see what had been kind of this all virtual recording that we had been doing which was really incredible for what it was to turn into this magical experience was 
nothing short of breathtaking to me. It, I just, I truly didn't realize that it could become as big as it actually had become. It was incredible. Lovely. Malik, how about for you as you look back? What are some of the takeaways for you from this experience? There, there's so many major takeaways, um, and I have to pick one, unfortunately. But the one for me was something that, was, you know, I've, I've done a lot of musical theater, but something I've never done is, is taught my own um, apprentice conductors. And, and so this was, uh, you know, taking something that I am so passionate about and having the opportunity to one-on-one -on -one um, coach someone else who might potentially do this someday um, and, and being able to answer those questions that are so hard to get answered as a music director um, and and being able to work with them and get them in front of an ensemble um, and, and watch their growth as Jake had mentioned earlier from what it looks like when they have probably done this for the first time in their entire lives conducting a 31 piece pit orchestra and then also accompanying that 31 using that orchestra to accompany vocalists. I mean, this is something that I talk about just getting in front of an ensemble. This is a huge undertaking and, and watching them for the first time that like they're taking those baby steps to watching them do it in front of a live audience um, was just something that was, was so, so rewarding for me to have, be a part of. Lovely. And uh, Jake, I know that you have, uh, I'm sure, a number of people you would like to thank. And before we get to the thanks part of this, if it's possible, do you have one or two just memories that will likely continue to just be so clear and present in your mind and your heart about this endeavor? Of course I do. Um, the, the first one that came to mind is I had written in a character in the show and he, uh, he dies on stage. And I was really, really worried that the audience would not understand uh, who that character was, who the true identity was, as it had been hinted throughout the show. And I was blessed to be sitting in the audience for the premiere. And that moment happened on stage. And behind me, I could just hear a wave of murmurs and hushing and whispers. And it immediately became clear to me that everyone understood. And that was one of the probably, I, I, I'm going to have to say, the one of the best moments in my life. It was just everything was understood. The audience responded the way that I wanted them to. That was amazing. So you're talking about, is anybody going to get what it is that I'm trying to get across through my art? Yeah. And, and recognizing that, oh my gosh, they get it. Yeah. They, this work, this, this had meaning. Wow. Yeah, that must that must be insanely satisfying to you as a creator. There's no other feeling. Yeah, I can say that. And as, as our time uh, runs out, as a matter of fact, here in just a, just a moment, if you ha there's a thousand people, I'm sure to, to thank, but we could have invited the whole cast on here. There's a whole host of people that we could uh, could certainly certainly thank uh, in that regard. We're seeing some great pictures of of you and some friends afterwards. Um, any parting words, Jake, from you here in about the 60 seconds or so as we wrap up our time together that you just like to share with anybody and everybody connected to this, either through the webinar or the actual production itself? Of course. Uh, obviously, I have to thank Malik and Dr. Fortune and all of the cast, everyone involved, poured their heart into this. Um, by no means did they have to. Um, additionally, this is a good time. This is a picture of my, me and my great aunt who dressed in purple there had introduced me to the actual musical so she was there that or the actual poems she was there um obviously i have to thank my family for their support throughout all this because um there there are times as, as an artist where you can come across as maybe not so uh <laughs> all there sometimes and they were patient with me and they understood that um and it, any any support at all from anyone was just something that I'm very thankful for. Well, this has been delightful to gather with all of you. Congratulations to you all for each and the role that you played. And to those of you who are watching, who are involved, congratulations to you on this incredible endeavor. Jake, to you particularly, thank you for bringing this to us. Uh, for thinking broadly and deeply, for engaging and taking on all of the challenges that 
uh, this brought to you and for serving as a result as a great model for all of us in, in that regard. Thank you everybody for joining in today. Uh, stay close to the arts that provide such meaning and such importance and grounding in life. Uh, and until next time, take good care. Bye now.